that tend to um, collect our attention, you know, and maybe uh, some people over in um, Midland, Odessa, Texas yesterday that their attention was gotten and uh, that's a horrible thing and we need to pray for them. But the uh, our our predicament here is much slower and uh, and we got a storm that's is is it ever coming? You know, it's like the it's a double edged sword with this forecasting, isn't it? I mean it do you imagine how would your life be different today if you did not know anything? If none of us in Florida knew anything about that storm until tomorrow, sure. you'd have had a better week, wouldn't you? <laughs> so sometimes knowing about the future is, uh, is illustrated to us that it's hard to live in the future. And, uh, and the reality is, is that living in tomorrow is not something we're capable of. And so it's unstable and uncertain and it brings, tends to bring fear when we dwell too much upon the morrow. And it seems like the forecast and everything is pulling us toward tomorrow, isn't it? And what God's word will do is it'll bring us back to today and how things really are. And so... Um, we are supposed to set our mind on things above where Christ is seated in the heavenlies. And uh, it doesn't matter if the world tries to pull us away. It doesn't mean we can't function in the middle of anything with our mind stayed upon the Lord. In fact, we'll be more able to deal with anything that this world has to offer when our mind is stayed on Christ. And so um, we have an adversary who doesn't want us to experience that victory for sure. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now the let's go through something. Uh, we're going to talk about a few storms in the Bible and we're going to do this hopefully very quickly. But uh, anybody know the first storm in the Bible? Noah. Noah's flood. Okay. Yeah. I'll get a hundred there. All right. So in... Uh, God told Noah that he was going to bring a flood on the earth. All right, God had a plan and a purpose, but he let his servant know ahead of time, and it looks like maybe even 120 years before it happened. Now, that's quite a forecast, isn't it? <laughs> now, you, you know, we're struggling to get all the shutters on our houses and all the stuff brought in. What if you had to build a 450-foot boat before the Lord storm came, huh? I'd, I'd be, be glad for a long forecast for that, wouldn't you? Okay. Well, in, in Genesis, in, in uh, chapter 7, you know, when Noah was in the boat, in the big ship, the ark, the, the literally box, it says, when he was in and the Lord had shut the door and he was safe in the ark, Okay, when that took place, in verse 11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now that, the world had never seen anything like that. And the first storm was worldwide, it was cataclysmic. And so God says, well, look, boy, that, that was a little overwhelming to these people. So when they got off the ark, what did God do? He put a bow, a rainbow in the sky. And that is a symbol of a covenant. It's not a symbol of anything else. It's a symbol of God's promise and covenant not to destroy the whole earth again with a flood. Okay? So it doesn't mean if you live in the in a canyon in Colorado and the rains come that you don't have to go to higher ground. It doesn't mean that, but, but it means that this world would not be destroyed again like it was. And so when God used this storm, he caused this storm, and we have to say, well, why did, did God do this? You know, um, look in Jeremiah 23, and... Uh, 
it's uh, I, I struggle with with understanding this okay and um, but there's something we need to understand we cannot blame the devil on everything sure. we're going to look at where where it goes but we can't we can't blame the devil and but we should be careful uh, somehow God broadcast this some some folks they clearly understood that when uh, the hurricane hit New Orleans it was God's judgment on that particular people and um, and if you have the mind of God there on that well fine but God does use storms for judgment and the very first storm was a judgment on this earth the very first storm was from God it was a judgment and it was devastating in the life that was gone so in Jeremiah 23 I think I told you I better go there myself Jeremiah 23 and verse 19 says behold a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. Now, that's what happened in the flood. Now, Noah and his family were protected from that, weren't they? So God brought his people through the flood, but the flood fell on the head of the wicked, and it took their lives. And God took credit for that. God says, I did that. So God is, uh, you understand the fear of God, the fear of the Lord in the Bible, when you see what God can do. And being the Lord of the universe and sitting on the throne of heaven, He has authority to do these things. Now, in all these things, the, the, the psalmist tells us that God has not punished us as our sins deserve. The prophet Isaiah, I believe, said that too. We have, we have not suffered as in accordance equal to our sins. And, uh, but God uses storms in such a manner. Uh, there's another storm in the book of uh, Jonah. You know uh, the story of Jonah? Uh, God tells, you can go to chapter 1 of Jonah and you see that God brings a storm. And so Jonah is a prophet of God in Israel and God appears to Jonah and says, Jonah, my prophet, one of my chosen people, I want you to go east. And I want you to go to a great city, Nineveh. Now they're, they're a bunch of unbelievers and they're, gonna, they're bad, they're going to destroy and, and uh, ravage your people. But I want you to go and preach to them. Give them a warning of the judgment I'm bringing on them. And Jonah says, yes, Lord. And he went west. He said he went down, got on a ship, and was going the other direction. Okay. Now, being on a ship, God had a tool. And it tells us there in Jonah that God sent a storm. And this ship was tossed, and this ship was, uh, <laughs> verse 4, the Lord sent, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And these guys, the, the sailors are working like crazy, doing everything they know, but they're, they know it's a bad situation. Now, it was revealed to them. And, and Jonah admitted it that God was after him. He wasn't after the sailors. He was after them. And so Jonah said, if you throw me overboard, you'll be okay. Now, and that's what happened. They took Jonah and they said, Lord, don't hold this against, this against us. They threw him over the, the, the side of the boat and the storm calmed. Now, in... in um, in Job and in Proverbs and in the book of uh, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, tells us that, verse 5, Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? 
My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And so in Jonah's case, we see the Lord, in Noah's case, he judged the wicked. And in Jonah's case, he used a storm to correct the sun. He used it to chasten and correct Jonah. We find with a little persuasion, and I think God has demonstrated that he can be very persuasive. He persuaded um, Jonah to do what he was asked to do. Jonah did it. Now he could have saved himself a lot of trouble by doing it right away, didn't he? But God worked. And he worked through a storm and other means in order to get Jonah to do what he was supposed to do. Now I think God uh, is still in the business of correcting his children. The whole idea of chastening here is bringing someone from childhood to maturity. The whole process. And you know that that includes all kinds of stuff. Okay, And some of it's painful and some of it's just instructive. God wants you to move from childhood to maturity. And there are things that if you are resisting as a child, God wouldn't say, well, forget about you. I don't care about you. No, God says, I do care about you. And I want to persuade you to follow me and do what's right. And so God used a storm, in a sense, to, uh, to bring that about. Now, in the, in the book of uh, Acts, in chapter 27, there's a storm. And uh, this one... This one here is a little more like I can relate to. You know, God gives a clear judgment in Noah, and he gives a clear chastening in Jonah. And we read the storm here in the life of the Apostle Paul, and you're going, well, what's this about? Okay. And so they, uh, (laughs) I like the way the scripture speaks about this. Um In uh, verse 13, it says, When the south wind blew softly, supposing they had attained their desire putting out the sea, they sailed close by Crete. So far, so good. But not long after, a a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocladon. You could make a movie out of that, couldn't you? And then, uh, so the ship was caught and... uh, and then it tells how they were uh, being pushed around. And, and look at verse uh, 19. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. They're like Jonah's guys. They're unloading stuff so the ship stays afloat. And then now, verse 20, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope was given. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Now, One of the things we understand here is in this case that God was working and these people are have come to the end of their rope. You know, like the um, the prodigal when he came to himself, that's all he had left. He lost everything else. He came to himself. That's all there was left. These folks have tried everything and they're they're out of options. And that's where they got where God wanted them because they had a man with them that knew the answer. And that was the Apostle Paul. And so one of the things we can see here is that the storm can be used of God to provide opportunity for his people to share the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ with folks. And so God worked to bring, he brought them to a place where there are people on this island who probably never would have heard otherwise. They were not places that, uh, that Paul had on his schedule, but they, God brought them there. They got to hear the gospel. The people on the ship got to see they needed God, and Jesus provided the answer. And so he, here's a great example of God using a storm. It's like, what is this for? Paul's got to get to Rome. You said he's going to Rome, but God says, well... Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. Sometimes there's sidebars, it seems like God wants us to go on. And he uses these things to direct. 
And so Paul gets opportunity. And God works in everything for our, the good of those who love him. And we need to b look beyond ourselves. The neat thing we learn from Paul in this situation, we don't have time to read the whole story, but if you look at Paul is not just about Paul. Paul is constantly concerned about the others. And in the midst of the storm, that is a powerful testimony. When you go through this storm, if the Lord brought it here, and you trusted the Lord, and you didn't freak out and panic, and some of your neighbors are freaking out and panic, and they say, well, what, what is it that allows you to remain calm? An opportunity to share about your trust in God. And so a storm can provide us with an opportunity to witness like it did with the Apostle Paul. Well, if we go to uh, closing here, we go to Matthew in chapter 4. No, Mark. Let's go to Mark. There's the stories found in both Mark 4. be Matthew 8, I believe, but we're going to Mark 4. And uh, and so there were several storms in the Gospels, but here is, is one, and it demonstrates God uses the storm. Now, God uses things in life. Do you remember the disciples ask Jesus, this guy who was born blind at birth, they said, well, did this man sin? <laughs> or did his parents sin that he was born blind? Y'all are scratching your head like, why would they think that this guy in the womb sinned or something? You know, I mean, how, how can you do that? He kicked mom out of, out of meanness, you know? No, they, they were confused about this. And so Jesus said, it, it wasn't either one. It was for the glory of God. Now, here we have to step back and look. And realize that we're not the center of the universe. I don't care how much God loves you. And the fact that Jesus died for you. You are not the center of the universe. God takes that place. And no one else. And so sometimes God uses. Circumstances and whatever. To remind us of that. And to demonstrate that. And so in, in Mark chapter 4. And uh, verse 36 now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and the other little boats were also with him. And it says in verse 37, a great windstorm, Mark 4, 37, a great windstorm arose and the waves beat on the boat so that it was already filling. Remember, it's not the boat in the water, so water in the boat is the problem. That's what they're getting. And he, and, uh, but Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow. I love that picture. Can you bet you that? Everybody's freaking out. Jesus is taking a nap. Can, you, can we be Jesus to somebody that way? Only if we're trusting him and not worrying about ourselves. And so he trusted his father. And so, uh, and they awoke him up. Hey, we're scared. You be scared with us. Misery loves company, doesn't it? And they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And so Jesus arose. I can see that. Oh, man, I had a good nap going. And he gets up and he pushes the sleep out of his eyes. And then he just rebukes the wind and the storm. Peace! Be still! Was that for Jesus? He could sleep in it. It was for his loved ones, his disciples. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now, what did that demonstrate? Well, it, it showed these guys something. Verse 41. It showed Jesus, that, and he told them they didn't have much trust in the Lord, did they? Okay. But in verse 41, it showed them, who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey his voice. Now, you need to be convinced about that. There's a, certain, uh, there's a certain peace that comes with that, isn't there? Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to talk to Jesus and because he's going to do whatever you ask him. I don't believe that. We should be asking for his will to be done. But when we ask this, we know that he is able. Don't even ask if you don't think God can do it. I mean, what's the point in asking but 
Jesus could sleep on a pillow because he knew his father had his life in his hands. And that's good hands. That's a safe place to be. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall ne never perish, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them me is greater than all and no one's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We, we, we look at life and we go, well, boy, this is more than I can handle. Sure. There's a lot of that. But Paul understood, whatever God wants me to do, I'm okay. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Doesn't mean I can run faster than a speeding bullet that I can be more powerful than a locomotive, I can leap tall buildings with a single bound. That's not what that's about. It's about living life in victory with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what it's about. And victory in, in that way doesn't look the same as the world sees victory. You know, the people that followed Jesus had a whole different idea of what it was like for him to be king than he did. They wanted somebody to take care of them, to feed them, and beat up the Romans. That's what they wanted. It wasn't about his authority. It wasn't about his honor. It, wasn't, it was about them. And we don't want to live that way. But who is this? This is the one, the winds and the waves obey him. Good night. I hope if, if the winds and the waves obey him, I sure don't want to be the one who's not. Do you? Oh, no. But look, I don't know. We're praying. I'm encouraged. The storm appears to be headed north and then maybe out to sea. I pray so. God commands it. And God uses it. And His ways are perfect. And we can trust Him. And we can have a peace that passes understanding if we will trust Him. And that's the victory of the Christian life. is not having smooth sailing. It's having peace in the middle of the storm. Because you know the one who commands it. And he's in control of your life. So that's easy preaching, hard living sometimes. But that's the call. A call to believe God. To trust him and rest in him. And I'm going to keep praying that God sends it out to sea. Because I know he can do it. But he's the one in charge, not me and not you. But let's join together and ask him to do that again.